The 2017 Two Sessions Meetings in Beijing. What are the major issues being discussed and what are the implications for China and the world? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. The big annual gathering of China's top political leadership and national lawmakers is still underway in Beijing. The Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference opened its session last week, and the National People's Congress began its annual meeting over the weekend. Important issues like China's economic plans and its international role are being discussed at what is called the Two Sessions. Joining me now from Beijing is Martina Fuchs. She's a business reporter for CGTN and is covering the Two Sessions. With me in the studio is Song Zhang. He is the chief correspondent for the Shanghai Wenhui Daily here in Washington. Also joining us from Shanghai is Yu Bing Kang. He is the chief economist with the Changjiang Pension Insurance. And with us from London is Duncan Innes Kerr. He is a senior editor with the Economist Intelligence Unit and leads a team covering Asia. Welcome to all of you to the show. Song, let's start with uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi's news conference on Wednesday talked about a whole range of issues. One of the issues he talked about are the, uh, is the missile tests being carried out by the uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK. He also talked about the planned deployment of this third anti-missile system by the United States in South Korea. Uh, let's take a listen to what he had to say. To defuse the looming crisis on the peninsula, China proposes that, as a first step, the DPRK may suspend its nuclear and missile activities in exchange for the halt of the large-scale U.S. ROK exercises. This suspension for suspension can help us break out of the security dilemma and bring the parties back to the negotiating table. So we have a plan there on the table, but can China de-escalate this crisis on the Korean Peninsula? Yes and uh, no. I think China has been very clear that only negotiation can solve the problem of North Korean uh, nuclear issue. And uh, since the last year, I think China proposed this double suspension and the dual track uh, diplomacy for North Korean nuclear issue. Double suspension means North Korea should uh, suspend its uh, nuclear and missile test. And at the same time, the U.S. should uh, suspend its joint military exercises with uh, South Korea. And the dual track means uh, from one angle, uh, denuclearization of uh, North Korea, and from another angle, a possible uh, peace treaty between especially America and uh, North Korea. But uh, in the last uh, couple of months, uh, I think uh, uh, North Korea has uh, again hold some uh, missile tests. And also the assassination of Kim Jong-un has made uh, the White House to be more furious. And I don't think uh, U.S. will be ready uh, to negotiate with uh, North Korea in the coming a few years. And also recently we see the White House has uh, suspended the uh, 1.5 uh, negotiation in New York between uh, North Korean uh, delegations with uh, American experts. So I think it will take a longer uh, process for this uh, negotiation to take effect and uh, we will see what will happen and uh, I think the trust is the most important issue. Right okay let's go to Beijing to Martina. Martina you've been covering the two sessions uh, over the past two days. Uh, a government work report has been released. What's the headlines from that report? Yes, Anand, the uh, government work report really is the document of the year for China. Uh, it is in English and also in Chinese. The English version counts about 42 pages and the Chinese version, the uh, Gongzuo uh, Baogao, about 32, a little bit shorter. You can imagine I needed quite uh, some time to go through and digest all this information. Overall, there was no big surprise, but the key takeaways were that China has cut its growth target for this year. Premier Li Keqiang said in the work report at the NPC opening that was on Sunday that the country aims to expand its economy by around 6.5%. Last year, as you remember, Anand China set a target of 6.5 to 7% a range. 
and ultimately achieved a 6.7% growth, which was a 26-year low. The most interesting part at all uh, of this, uh, in my opinion, was the half sentence that followed the magic uh, GDP number, which said GDP growth of around 6.5% or higher if possible in practice. It shows uh, to me that domestic and global uncertainties and financial market volatility are definitely on the rise. In terms of inflation, the government's annual CPI target has been set at 3%. That was um, after prices rose 2% right. last year. And now continuing with supply side reforms and excess capacity cuts uh, will be crucial at this point. Okay, let's go to Shanghai to our guest there, Yu Ping Kang. Welcome to the show. Uh, looking at those numbers mm -hmm. there that uh, Martina right. just gave us, growth of 6.5%, uh, do you think the country is on target uh, Ping Kong to meet that growth target. Right. And another thing, will the country be, will that, will that plan be able to deliver the 11 million urban jobs that Premier Lee has been talking about? Right. So, you know, first of all, the 6.5% GDP growth rate it, it at least indicates that the Chinese economy is already kind of stabilizing. As a lot of people put it, that the Chinese economy already gets to the flat end of the L-shaped economy. Uh, and then uh, I think that in terms of job creation, that we have to see that in recent years, in almost each year, the, China, uh, the Chinese government has met its job creation target. Uh, and even though with a little bit slower GDP growth rate, I think the reason, the very reason behind it is that the Chinese economy is undergoing profound transition from this investment-driven economy to the consumption-driven economy, from manufacturing-oriented to the servicing-oriented. Uh, and in the service industry, for each unit of GDP uh, gen that, that can generate more jobs. So I think that's the reason. So I don't think there's any uh, 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 difficulty to meet the job creation target. I think that it will be the case again, that the, the, the job creation will exceed the target again this year. Right, Duncan, uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping has made the case for what he called an open-door China policy that will continue to push investment and trade. Uh, then we have Foreign Minister Wang Yi, who is talking of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, he talked about that on Wednesday. Let's take a listen to part of what he had to say. With protectionism and unilateralism on the rise, the Belt and Road initiative is a common cause where all countries roll up their sleeves and pitch in together. The initiative will help to rebalance economic globalization and make it more inclusive and equitable. So, Duncan, how important is this globalization theme that is coming from China? Well, I think it's, uh, it's great to see that at least one major country is still championing globalization in a, in a time when we're seeing protectionism on the rise in places uh, like the US uh, and much of Europe as well. Uh, I think there is also uh, an element of the strange here because, uh, of course, you know, China's domestic market does remain uh, closed in many different sectors. So my own personal hope is that uh, in championing uh, the case for globalism at home, uh, China is also uh, going to be committed to opening its own markets uh, in, uh, to foreign competition. Song, a big focus of the China-U.S. relationship is, of course, uh, now the fact that the United States has a new president. Donald Trump has become president. Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, sounded hopeful at his news conference. He said, in essence, that if there are no conflicts, no confrontation, if there's mutual respect, uh, there is no reason, he said, why these two countries uh, could not have an excellent relationship. What's your reading of how the China-U.S. relationship will evolve? I think in the last uh, few months, uh, U.S.-China relationship has uh, seen some significant uh, uh, change. And we know President Trump, when he was in the campaign, uh, was a little bit rhetorically against China on a currency issue and trade deficit issue. But since he joined the uh, White House, uh, I think his attitude has been uh, changed. And uh, we see some uh, exchanges in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, Mr. Uh, Trump and uh, President Xi had a very good phone conversation. And uh, our state councillor, uh, Yang Jiechi, was here in D.C. Uh, last week. And uh, uh, we heard uh, Secretary of State uh, Tillerson will be visiting China, Japan, and uh, Korea very soon. And uh, so I think uh, uh, U.S. government uh, policy toward China has uh, uh, being in the process to, 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 uh, of change. And uh, Mr. Uh, 
Mnuchin, Secretary of uh, uh, Treasury, has said recently on the issue of uh, currency manipulation issue. He said he will follow the current procedure to determine whether China is a manipulator or not. I think according to the current three-point uh, criteria, China is not a currency manipulator. Martina, uh, the big buzzwords we're hearing from China, economic reform. We're halfway through the sessions right now. What are the biggest outcomes so far on that front? Absolutely. There are so many reforms, too many to mention here, Anand. But most importantly, the government said it plans to push forward with corporate tax cuts and fee reductions, supply-side reforms, local debt restructuring, and HUCO and related social safety net reforms, among many others. In terms of taxation, Premier Li said the government aims to cut companies' tax burden by about 51 billion US dollars this year and for 2017 this year also the Ministry of Finance estimates that the overall tax and fee reductions will exceed 550 billion yuan. China will also maintain a prudent and neutral monetary policy. Many economists I talk to here in Beijing say they don't expect any major monetary intervention. And since February, actually, the central bank has raised only by tiny increments the uh, interest rates on some uh, lending facilities. Uh, but uh, they really don't expect any major intervention in the near term. Very important is also that the NDRC, which stands for the National Development and Reform Commission, uh, announced that it would shut or stop the construction of coal-fired power plants with capacity of more than 50 million kilowatts. So I do hope that this will bring us some bluer skies uh, here in Beijing and that we will see more environmental reforms happening this year around. Right, Duncan, those reforms there that uh, Martina has been outlining, what do you make of them? Well, I mean, uh, there's very little actually new in there. It's great to see the continued commitment to supply-side reform. Um, and I think that uh, the important thing that's come out of this is really the message on uh, credit growth and the need to sustain growth at around 6.5% this year. Uh, we think, in actual fact, that'll be relatively easy to achieve, given the momentum that the economy has coming into 2017. Uh, and also the political imperative to, to maintain things ahead of the party congress later in the year. Uh, but also, if you look at the monetary supply growth targets, they're very much in line with this sort of continued, relatively relaxed uh, credit environment. Um, I think there are still tasks ahead uh, on financial sector reform and particularly on uh, tackling some of the bad debts that are building up in the banking sector. Uh, we've not heard an awful lot about that uh, recently, but if the supply side reform moves forward, uh, then that will help to address that in the longer term. Ping Kong, the other big buzzword we're hearing out of China is innovation. That's a word we've been hearing for mm -hmm. quite some time right now. President Xi Jinping actually stressed the need for innovation uh, to help projects like the One Belt, One Road initiative. What kinds of innovation does China need to keep the economy surging? Right, so at least there are two types of innovation. One is incubation of new industries, such as artificial intelligence, new materials, and biomedicine, etc. Uh, and second, and more importantly, is upgrading of the traditional industries. Uh, and international experience has indicated that the second one can create more jobs and, uh, and has more bigger impact to the uh, economy overall. And China, to this end, the Chinese government uh, decides to firmly implement the program called Made in China 2025. Uh, and all of these requires uh, a good so soft social in infrastructure, such as uh, intellectual property uh, protection, uh, you know, law enforcement, uh, and uh, investment in R&D, etc., uh, and uh, for which the Chinese government has put in a great effort. Uh, and the last thing I want to point out is that the, 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 the spirit of entrepreneurship and creation uh, are, are really born in the gene of the Chinese people. Okay, we're going to take a break right now. Much more on China's two sessions. When we come back, stay with us. You're watching The Heat.